Um, so hi folks, my name is Steve Watts. I work for Red Hat in the Office of Technology on Emerging Technologies. And uh, over the last two years, I've been predominantly focused on containers and storage. And uh, so I'm also part of the Kubernetes storage SIG, been working on that for about the whole two years. And so, you know, in the storage SIG, we've done a lot of work of connecting Kubernetes, you know, using Kubernetes with storage platforms. So in 1.4, we had a whole lot of um, updates around dynamic provisioning and storage classes. That's actually not what this talk is about. This talk is about running storage platforms in Kubernetes. So I've got the simple task of, in five minutes, explaining how you run a, a complex stateful system inside Kubernetes. So the example that I'm walk, walking you through today is GlusterFS, right? So GlusterFS is kind of a, a, an easy thing to, to use. It's, it's open source, but if you like it, there's commercial support available. It's scale out, you know, to petabyte scale. There's, you know, it's software-defined storage, so it's not, not an appliance. It's actually really easy to containerize and use. Um, but most importantly, I'm not manufacturing storage out of thin air in Kubernetes. Um, it runs on commodity infrastructure, but those infrastructure, those servers actually need local disk. And what it'll do is it sort of federates the local disk, exposes a file API out of that, and that's what the dynamic provisioners consume storage out of. It's mature. It's got a well-established community. It's uh, very viable. But specifically, like once you've got the storage platform running inside Kubernetes, it's got all the support for the volume plugins and the dynamic provisioners already inside Kubernetes. So if you want to basically mount Gluster volumes within your pods or provision storage outside a Gluster, you can do that. So this is the actual deployment topology, right? So imagine you have like, I don't know, if you're on-premise, right? Uh, it's the main reason you do this. Um, you have, say you have 20 node or 100 node cluster. You need at least three of those nodes to be uh, with kubelet hosts to have a local disk available, an unformatted local disk. At least one, it supports more than one, but you need at least one. And on that, we'll, on one of those hosts, we'll run a GlusterFS pod, right? It's just a containerized GlusterFS running inside a pod and mounting slash dev, right? I have slash dev SDB as an example, uh, but it could be anything. And then we also have a RESTful service interface pod. So this is what the, the Kubernetes dynamic provisioner talks to. This exposes a service, and when you, su you submit a claim against the GlusterFS storage class, and you say, hey, I want 100 gigabytes of storage, um, it will talk to this interface, and this interface will manage the communication with the actual GlusterFS file system to go and provision that volume, and then provide the information back to create a persistent volume so you can use it. So that's sort of what's ex demonstrated here. So, you know, it starts off with an administrator. Once this thing is deployed, right, the administrator would create a storage class. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is, as I mentioned, part of uh, cube 1.4. So you can create an arbitrary storage class. You call it GlusterFS. But in that thing, you point out, like, hey, I want to use the Kubernetes GlusterFS provisioner. And then once that's done, the developer says, hey, I want 100 gigabytes from GlusterFS storage class, provisions the storage, and then you use it in your pod. So I'm now going to give you a demo of this. Can I get a bit more help piping this thing out? I need that to the screen. All right. All right, there we go. All right. OK, so the first thing I'm going to show you is that I'm going to do kube control get nodes. You're going to see a master. I've got three nodes here. And I'm going to go off, and I have a bunch of files. So you get this with the project when you clone the project. What I'm going to do is now deploy the Gluster nodes. If you remember on the deployment side, you saw that there was a pod on each one of these nodes. So I'm actually going to basically do a sed where I'm going to replace the actual uh, node name inside the file and submit the deployment. And that will actually start the GlusterFS pod. Like you'll see now, I'll go and change it from node 0 to node 1 and again to node 2. Now, we are going to automate this probably into a daemon set. We haven't done it yet, but there should be nothing technically uh, present, preventing us from this. So now, once we've done that, we're going to create a service account. 
So this is for the RESTful service interface to communicate securely to the pods. We get a secret out of that, so we're going to store that in an environment variable. So you can see that there. Okay, and then we're basically going to add that information to a, a file to actually deploy the RESTful service. So the, the, the API server and the secret name. So once that's deployed, you can do a cube control get pods, and you can see all those three GlusterFS pods are running, as well as Heketi, which is the, uh, the name of our RESTful service. And uh, you can actually see that there's a, a service endpoint for Heketi. Um, now, this is kind of what's interesting. Now, once we've got the RESTful service, it actually doesn't know about the Gluster pods or anything about its deployment topology. So we're actually, when I do a cluster list, you can see it's empty, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to pass in the deployment topology to the, to the RESTful interface and tell it about the Gluster pods, which ones it has, and what block devices are available. So you can see we've passed that in, and it's automatically adding each node and each block device so there's three on each node here. And now it is aware of this. But the problem is that um, this information is all stored in memory on state. But now it has a distributed file system. And uh, time up? OK. And, uh, and so just about over. And, um, and so uh, it can persist that, that information on the distributed file system. And then um, you're able to provision uh, volumes directly out of that. So now it's, it's redeploying itself, and um, it'll, it, it's the, the service comes back up with uh, its database on a distributed file system instead of in memory, and we can then provision vol volumes. I need like 30 seconds, and I'm done. All right, and so I think I'm out of time, so I've got to get off the stage. Um, but uh, that's it. All right, thanks, folks. Go, go uh, check out this website if uh, 